The purpose of this video is to discuss the fabrication of a transpalatal bar or transpalatal arch, hereafter known as TPA, on your patient. You can make this intraorally after the bands have been cemented, but it is extremely challenging to do so on your first several cases, so I would strongly encourage you to cement the bands, take an alginate over the bands, and then pour up the model and fabricate the bar on the model. Of course, you cannot insert the bar into the sheaths because the sheaths are made of stone, but you can get it very, very close, and then it should fit very nicely when it comes time to take it to the oral cavity. So on this model, or I should say on this typodont, the first step is to select the length of the transpalatal arch that will go from molar to molar in this patient. You can see this bar I've selected goes approximately in the central grooves, approximately in the central grooves of the upper molar, and this is a very good place to start. It needs to be longer than intended, uh, longer than it looks, because it has to go down to the depth of the palate. So let me show you what it is that we're trying to accomplish with this. So we'll take the handy plastic ruler and measure down into the depth of the palate, and you can see I'm pushing the ruler down into the palate, and then we'll go across to the other side, and you can see, you can see that this is approximately uh, 54 millimeters, something like that, 52 millimeters. So the ruler sitting all the way down into the depth of the palate. And what you would like to have is the transpalatal bar after it's formed. This palatal side should be one to three millimeters off of the palate. And it can't be much further than that or it will impinge on the tongue space if it goes up the other way. So this is a very good place to start is the central fossa. If the palatal vault is very deep, then you should make it go across the buccal cusp tips. Conversely, if the palatal vault is shallow, you would make it go across the palatal cusps, and that would be a decent place to start. There's always adjustability in the loop here in the middle. That's what this is for, is for length adjustments. So you can make it bigger or smaller depending on the needs of the patient and what it is you're trying to accomplish. So we have several distinct steps that we can do to make the transpalatal bar fit down into the depth of the vault. The armamentaria for this will be a light wire plier. This is a hollow chop plier. And in Europe, this is known as a Della Rosa. This is a three prong plier. And this is an angled how plier with an M5 paddle. And this M5 paddle you see has a diameter to the paddles that's very nice for fitting inside of this loop for adjustment purposes. This plier is also very nice to insert and remove the TPA bar because it's a nice thing to grab that little handle right there and it is also a good thing to click it in and out and you can see there's serrations on the inside right here and that's to help it not slip and harm the patient. So the first part is to form the bar down to the depth of the palate. It's very important in the beginning to make sure that the bar goes all the way down to the depth of the palate. It's a very common mistake to not make it go deep enough into the palate. I don't always have a hollow chop plier available to me. That's this like a big three prong, but I have a light wire plier in every kit. And those of you who have heard me lecture, you know I like to do everything with this plier because I always have one. So I'll start the contouring of the palatal bar by holding it very tightly with my fingers so it doesn't slip. And then I will contour it so it's shaped like a U, not like a V. And I'll show you that in just a moment. And then I'll return that U loop back to the proper orientation. And you can see that this is shaped like a U, not like a V. The V part would make it go too far away from the side walls of the palate. So again, shaped nicely to contour in there and make sure it goes all the way down to the de depth of the palate, like that. You can see that it goes all the way into the depth of the palate. And initial observation, it looks like it's too short. Well, it might be too short, but you will see in a moment that it will be a few millimeters off of the palate. The wire you're looking at right here is an 036 blue duraloy. That's what the wire is made out of, and it has a certain temper. This is the Gosh-Gerian double back bend 
right there that goes in a Gashgirian sheath. And here is the sheath, and you can see that sheath is an 036 by 072, and you can't see it, but on your Typodont, if you'd looked at this, doctors, you would see a small detent on the back side. And when we put the bar in here, you'll feel like, or you'll hear a little click. And if the tubes or the sheaths are new, you'll actually feel it. These have been used a few times, so it's not as noticeable. So the next step for the bar is to mark it three to five millimeters, three to five millimeters below the level of the sheath. And you will mark it, and I will estimate it. And this is the offset bend, and the offset bend is necessary to clear this gingival cuff right here and right here, because this is a very common spot for impingement. So for that, it's very handy to use the three-prong plier. And remember, this is going to go toward the sheath, and I'll see if I can get that right here for you to see better. And it's going to go toward the sheath, and when I squeeze that, it's a 15 to 20 degree bend. It doesn't have to be measured. And you can see that it's going to it's going to exit the sheath and go lingually before it goes gingivally. And this is to avoid that gingival cuff. So let me do the other side. And put that right here and squeeze that so it goes toward the sheath. Next is the hard part. Now you have to evaluate the double back bend, how it relates to the sheath in three planes of space. And the three planes of space are this dimension of space is toe in and toe out, this dimension of space is tip, and this dimension of space as you look at it is torque. And when I say torque I'm referring to the angle that the double back bend is going to go into that sheath. So this is torque, and this dimension is tip, and this dimension is toe in and toe out. So we will hold the bar up against that, hold the bar up against this one, and I'm kind of memorizing what it is that I see with respect to torque and tip and so forth. And I'll put it down in here, Hopefully, we'll be able to evaluate together what the torque looks like. And you can see that the torque has uh, is quite incorrect on this one. So let me make those corrections now. And again, I'm going to use the light wire plier. Technically, you're supposed to use the lingual arch forming plier, but I didn't bring that out because, again, I usually use this. And it works just fine as long as you have it right next to that and you don't distort the double back bend. So the first thing I'm going to do is to correct that torque, and that torque correction is made by bending it this way. The toe in and toe out direction is made by bending it this direction back and forth until you're satisfied with that. And then the tip dimension of space is holding across here and then adjusting it by bending it up or down. Then I'll hold this handle and I'm going to partially insert the double back bend into the sheath. And what you're looking at now is it's exiting the sheath. And notice that it goes away from the gingival cuff right there. And it doesn't touch the palate. And the success or the accuracy of this side is seen by what it looks like on this side. If this were perfect, if this were perfect, that wire would go right toward the mesial aspect of that sheath, right toward the mesial aspect of that sheath. But you can see it's not perfect. It's not perfect. This tells me that the toe in and toe out on this side is not correct, is not correct. So let me remove it and you will probably have to use, you will probably have to use this how plier and you have it across the back, oops, the back end and you squeeze that grab this handle and with a firm finger rest you're going to remove the bar. So I needed this side to point to the mesial of the sheath. In other words it needed to go that direction away from me. So I will hold this part right here and then I will push this end so it's essentially going away from me and that's a toe out bend. Now let's reinsert and see how we did.
And again, if everything was ideal, if everything was ideal, this would be headed right toward the mesial of that sheath. And let me zoom this up a little bit so that you can see that. So this tells you when the sheath and the wire are right next to each other that the bend you just completed on this side is very nearly perfect. Now you remove this side and do the same thing on that side. While it's here, you can see the toe in and toe out dimension. This distal end needs to be pointed out, so it needs some toe out. Let's see what the tip looks like. Mm, the tip looks very nice. And when I say tip, I'm referring to the parallelism of the double back bend with the sheath. The double back bend with the sheath. And in this plane of space, the torque, the torque, you can see, uh, yeah, you can see that it's pretty close too. So with a very minor adjustment, this one should be pretty close. So let me remove this side and then I will adjust this side. So I will click that out. Remember, yours is going to be much more difficult than that because this sheath is a little bit worn out. So I'm going to first adjust the toe in and toe out because I've memorized what that looks like. And then I'm going to adjust the torque, which was a dimension of space that you couldn't see very well. And now I'll insert just this side that I adjusted. Now let's see how successful we are on his side. Now we should, we should see with this one inserted, the bar goes right across and it ends up right at the mesial of that sheath. And it will be evaluating now again the quality of the first one that we did together. And you can see the torque dimension of space. Let me get that a little tighter. The torque dimension of space looks really good. The tip dimension of space looks really good and the toe in, toe out dimension of space looks really good. So don't expect your first one to be that fast and that easy, but it's just a matter of looking at what the sheath angulation is and then bending that into the double back bend on the TPA. So next we'll insert this and it should insert passively if everything was great. And this bar is a little bit far away from the palette uh, it's hard to see on this clear model, but it doesn't touch anywhere. And that's critical. That's critical. So make sure that it doesn't contact the soft tissue anywhere because it should be one to three millimeters away from the palate. So now you have just made a passive TPA. Now, let's talk about the insertion and removal since we can zoom this up a little bit better. Right there. <clears throat> excuse me, there is the double back bend is sticking out the end of that sheath right there and this is the end of the sheath. So to remove it, you'll put the plier beak on the end right there, the double back bend, put the other end of the plier on the sheath here or here, it doesn't matter, and then you squeeze and then that curved how plier will squirt this thing out the end, then you grab the handle and then you, with a firm finger rest, you can remove it from the mouth carefully. So <clears throat> let's see if I can do that and still have you be able to see it at home. And there it goes across the double back bend at the end. And as I said, mine's kind of worn out so you didn't hear the click. And then I grab this handle and with a really firm finger rest on this side or someplace, then you're going to remove it. Because if you don't have a good finger rest, you can slip and then harm the patient severely by this, because it takes some horsepower to get that out of here. So let's see if this side has any better click to it put here and it should unclick and then grab it here or grab the handle firm finger rest on the opposite side and then you can remove it like so all right so having a passive tpa a passive tpa is very important so that you don't cause any unwanted movements of the molars and those of you who heard me lecture about this i tell you a nice horror story about that that happened to me and we don't have time for that here so while I have your attention, let's talk about the adjustment of a TPA for expansion because that's by far the most common thing that you will do with a transpalatal bar. And I'll get a flat bar back out of the inventory again so that we can demonstrate that easier. Of course, they're hard to get out of the bag when there's a million of them in there. So my apologies for that. And the classic the classic method 
to do the expansion, that is by the POS instructions, are right here. And what you're going to do, or what we are supposed to do, is you put the how plier right in the U loop right there, and then you squeeze it, and it's going to expand it. And I'll do that for us right now. And you squeeze it, and you can see it expand it. So that's point number one to squeeze. And then you want to make the two ends get back to be parallel again. So this is point number two to squeeze, point number two to squeeze, and then point number three, point number three is right there. And then once you're done, you convince yourself that the bar is back to being straight again, and it should be longer than it was before. And I believe this was a 50 millimeter bar to begin with. So at the end, at the end, uh, no, it must have been a short bar, but at the end, you can clearly see that this is longer than it was before. So that's the textbook way to do that. And you're supposed to be bending that intraorally, and that's really difficult to do. And if you are uh, Bob McNamara or Bob Ricketts or one of those geniuses of ortho, you know what it feels like to squeeze in just the right, the, the right amount. But you and I are not that good. So what I strongly encourage you to do is disconnect the bar on one side, disconnect the bar on one side, and then make the expansion so that you can see exactly what the outcome is on this side. Exactly what the outcome is. So in a clinical situation, let me start over. In a, <coughs> in a clinical situation, you're supposed to bend it in one, two, three places to make the expansion. But I find that too difficult. But that's the POS way. And that's the way your instructor probably taught you how to do that. So now let's talk about the Jeff Taylor way. And again, this is not POS talking. This is just me. So intraorally, I will remove it from the sheath and just remove one side. And then this is the instrument that's in my hand as a curved how plier. I'm going to support the contralateral side with my thumb like that. And then with a nice firm finger rest, I'm just simply going to stretch the bar. And can you see that bar get stretched? And then when I'm done, it goes over the palatal cusp tip. Can you see that? So that's two to three millimeters of expansion right there. The same instrument that's in my hand already. I'm just going to pick up that little handle and stick it right back in the slot. Click it into place and I'm done. Fast, easy, efficient. No changing of instruments. That's what I like. There's no danger in over expanding a TPA bar. Let me do that for you here. And when I say over expand it, I'll stretch the daylights out of it like that. And it doesn't really matter how much you stretch it because when you pick it back up here and you insert it back into that sheath, immediately remove it and you'll see all of that stretch you put in the loop pretty much just disappeared and you're right back over the palatal cusp tip where you were before. So it's hard to overactivate one of these, but it's easy to underactivate. All right, so that was our introduction to transpalatal bar fabrication. And now we'll go on to something else. All right, thank you for watching. I hope this has been informative and educational.